Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this training on electric mobility for Kigali, um, organized by the Solutions Plus Consortium. I think that uh, now several of you know us. So we are an EU-funded uh, project and a consortium of 46 core partners that you can see here on the right and 116 associated partners. Um, so we are very happy to have uh, you today for this training on EV charging infrastructure. Before I show you the agenda, I would like to give you a brief overview of our activities in Kigali. Um, so you can see here, we do data collection on electric mobility to measure the impact. We offer capacity building activities. We support some startups, as here you can see, Ampersand and Pura Right. Uh, we have an incubator program. We also do connections with the EU industry. Um, we support our demonstration in Kigali through um, some budget for the city of Kigali and equipment. We work as well on urban planning aspects, as you can see, uh, to show how electric mobility deployment can look like on the ground. We work as well on uh, gender component and mobility research. And finally, it's very important for us to also provide policy recommendations to support the further uptake of electric mobility and to uh, provide some connections with investors and developing finance institutions. Um, so as I said today, the topic is on electric vehicle charging infrastructure. I would like first to recall that we have already addressed in the past uh, this topic through a global training, but also through an Africa training that was held about three weeks ago. Um, we already tackled some important aspects such as standards and interoperability, charging needs and localization strategies, financing, business and conceptual models, and electric public transport. Um, so if you have missed it, uh, no worries, you can still access the recordings and the presentations on the Solutions Plus website, and you can see here the link. Uh, we will also include, we have included some of these elements and this information in the policy advice paper on EV charge infrastructure that we will soon make public. So today, the, this session on Kigali is part of a series of training sessions that we do the whole week that cover the situation in Kigali, in Dar Salaam tomorrow and uh, on Thursday, and uh, Kenyan cities on Friday. So today we want to ask the question uh, about the next steps in Rwanda and in Kigali for electric mobility. What happened next? So to do so, first we will have a part on the planning and the policies for electric mobility. What are the policies that can support the further uptake? Secondly, we will um, address uh, aspects such as public space and the impact on urban planning. And finally, we will have the pleasure to have a high level panel with government officials to discuss um, a possible strategy at Kigali level for the further uptake of electric mobility. So thanks again for being with us today. A few practical um, aspects. We have started recording the session and if you have any questions, we will be very pleased to take them on board. So please indicate your questions in the chat and my colleagues, Judith Obinga and Elmin Teko will collect them and we will address them during the Q and A. So with this, thanks again for being here and I leave the floor to our colleagues, Katie, thanks. Hi, Emily, thank you. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay. Can you see now my screen? Yes, we can. It's all fine? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for being in this session today. So we hope to provide some interesting insights on um, the planning and policy for e-mobility. Uh, so in this presentation, we will review um, e-mobility and integrated planning together. We will focus on the integration of e-mobility in urban planning processes from a methodological and practical uh, perspective. So um, we will see, uh, for example, immobility and integrated planning. As I said, we will see how to address electrification in the context of SOMP. I will explain you also what it is. 
And then we will see very briefly a, a good practice example in um, Barcelona. So um, the SMP methodology, maybe some of you have heard about this. This is uh, um, the methodology that helps us to, uh, to develop a sustainable urban mobility plan. So this, uh, this method is consisting, as you can see in this graph, of a cycle of uh, four phases and 12 steps. But uh, this is, of course, an idealized representation of how the planning process is in practice, right? In practice, uh, you, can, you will not go through all the steps one by one, you know, in this order specifically. It can, some, of, some, some steps you can, do it, you can do them first, some other second, and it, you know this is going to be a very dynamic process in practice, right? So um, in this uh, in this framework, we have to see also how to integrate immobility along this planning process. One, when we are doing a sustainable local mobility plan, so we have to see also from a holistic perspective how electrification will help us to achieve our SUMP goals and to uh, reach the, the main objectives of our plan or the transformation of our cities, right? So we will see this here a bit more in detail going through the uh, sub cycle very quickly. So for example, if we go to the first phase on the preparation and analysis, in this part, what we are going to see is uh, we will see uh, we will check the groundwork for the planning process. For example, we will set up the effective working structures, the planning framework. We will also analyze the mobility situation, right? So here, for example, what we need to do is to identify which entities, both public and private, can provide capacities, skills, experience, and resources for the development of, uh, of the plan and also for the implementation of measures, right? So um, we have to make sure we have all the skills and resources needed, not only like human resources, but also financial as well, right? Um, so in this part uh, about uh, when we are analyzing this, the mobility situation, right? The, the challenges and opportunities, we have to see also electrification how electrification will help us to solve some problems and also what is needed for the implementation of e-mobility measures. So what is needed on infrastructure, for example, on types of services, about regulation, etc. cetera. Uh, as we know, e-mobility means bringing two sectors together, so energy and mobility. So here it's very important to identify all relevant stakeholders and also to understand their different roles and interests. So uh, with this aim, we, we need to make sure that we can cover the whole value change and also all levels of expertise. Um, so for example, it's very important to set up new cooperation models on the basis of mutual benefit. So this will help us to have a good internal communication or coordination, uh, for instance, for instance um, um, among um, planning departments, and also to have a good external cooperation with operators, the industry, the academia, et cetera. Um, one key aspect is to plan on the basis of the user needs. Here in this graph, you can see the different gr user groups, and we need to identify you know, all these different needs. So who are these groups? What are their needs? What are their interests? so that we can respond to them. Uh, in order to, to, to reach you know, a critical uptake of uh, immobility, we need to change and we need to uh, shift from a technology and cost drive approach to one that focuses on understanding the requirements and the preferences and concerns of potential users. So focusing on the user. You know? Uh, so this, uh, this we, need to, we need to see from a technical and op operational also aspect. You know? So in this way, for example, we can use urban design, we can use special planning and user, user behavior, uh, for example, measures to address the user needs. And this will help us to reach you know, a high public acceptance of the measures in, the, in our city. 
Um, when we see more in detail, for example, the requirements for charging infrastructure, we will see that it's very important to, to have a clear, uh, clear idea of the ownership and responsibility of the operation. Now, this is very important. So on one hand, for example, the private companies, uh, they, have, they can have better know-how regarding the technological developments, also regarding the skills maybe, and uh, to, to reduce risks and financial uh, burden on the municipality, right? Uh, however, if we leave everything to the market players, this can uh, affect the interoperability, for example, of the e-mobility solutions. And also, um, this, this should be clarified when we are tendering the, the concessions or the contracts, right? On the other hand, for example, if the ownership has the municipality, right, the ownership and operation, the municipality can manage better, for example, the quality, design of the service, also the data that is collected. The municipality also maybe can get revenues from the services, right? But sometimes the, the authorities might not have all the resources and technical capacities to manage such a big network like this, right? Or to cover, maybe to have all the finance to cover these high investments. So there are advantages and, it, and disadvantages on both sides. If we go now to the phase two, in this in the second phase of the of the planning process, we will focus on um, building our scenarios, also our, our common vision, and setting targets and objectives, and also seeing how we can concretely achieve, you know, this main vision for our for the transformation of the mobility in our cities. So what is important here is that uh, in each of the scenarios we can we need to integrate immobility measures so that we can see the impact that it, it can have you know in the wider transport system right so um, it's very important uh, not to not to look immobility you know as a standalone measure but to consider it in the broader overview of the of the vision of the city so that it can be part of the of the decarbonization of transport for example in the city and to achieve also a better quality of life safety and accessibility in our city so here uh, as we mentioned electromobility goes beyond the technological transformation of vehicles so it requires a holistic approach no so we will see that uh, more in detail so for example um, this requires that immobility e should be the, an integral part of the of achieving a multimodal and sustainable mobility system. For example, uh, we should we can consider you not know, to have um, public transport as the backbone of our cities, uh, while um, micro mobility and shared or on demand services could cover the first and last mile last miles no so keeping that in mind we can structure the aims and objectives also and the measures also of uh, of the sup in our cities so for example um talking about addressing all user needs it is important to develop uh, a plan for citizen engagement and involvement along the planning process so this will ensure that the citizens uh, they can um, ensure also the continuity of the implementation of measures. And in this graph, we, we can see the different types of activities that we can prepare along the planning process, depending on the level of engagement, which could be from informing very low level of engagement to empowerment to a high level of engagement. So we can see here different types online and also physical, and I invite you to see this more in detail in our SUMP guide, which I can send at the link in the comments later. Um, on the phase three, um, we in this part, we will move from the strategic to a more operational level. This phase will focus on developing an action plan on also um, developing, uh, for example, um, targets and see and develop and seeing more concretely which measures are we going to implement and uh, also check the financing of these measures and prepare for the adoption of these planning documents. 
So in regards to immobility here, we, we, can, re we can realize that immobility touches on different aspects of, um, of the SUP, of the planning, of the mobility planning objectives of our cities. So in this case, uh, it's maybe, maybe would be important to, to develop a different immobility strategy, I mean, to separate, sorry, a separate mobility strategy that can help us gather all the SUMP measures related to immobility. And this separate document could be seen, for example, as an annex to the SUMP and follow also the same principles. Um, on the operational uh, aspect, you know, for the for the implementation of the uh, of the charging infrastructure, uh, what is important here um, is we need to consider some key aspects. You no, know? one is the cooperation framework. So uh, we need to have uh, the right framework for the cooperation and communication among entities, as we've seen. We need to bring together these two sectors, right? Energy and transport. And within each of them, there are several organizations and institutions of both uh, um, public and private and NGO and et cetera. So we need to provide this right framework for cooperation. Also important to see the data management aspect uh, so that we can really have the data to respond to needs right, whenever it's changing. And so we need to check this uh, also with the operators that are providing the service and ensure the interoperability as well so that we make sure that, that the user can access, right, maybe this service plus the other service and they don't have limitations of barriers or barriers between services because two services are provided uh, by different operators, right? So these are important aspects to consider. On the last phase, here we will see the implementation and monitoring. So here uh, we accompany, you know, the implementation of the measures, and then we see how we are doing, and also we learn, you know, we review regularly and we learn what can we Im improve, you know, um, after we have implemented some of the measures. So for example, here on the management, you know, of implementation of um, some of the immobility measures, for example, for, uh, for charging infrastructure, we can see, you know, what the investments are needed for new measures that, well, that we want to implement. Uh, also, we can consider to widen, you know, the, the, uh, co the coverage of immobility solutions, right? To cover all public fleets. So, for example, public transport, also urban freight, different types of vehicles that we have in our cities and we can do this progressively. And also we can, we can have flexibility, right? So that we, we can see how, uh, for example, measure, like what is the impact from the, from the EVs currently? And then what do we need to do more so that we have a greater impact in, uh, for example, in air quality or in the reduction of noise. You can see more in our topic guide, electrification and uh, planning for um, electric transport in this SUMP context. Here also is the link and I can, I can put it also in the comments. There is a, a complete guide there. Oops. And to see very briefly the case of Barcelona, here what they do was to, uh, in Barcelona, they, they were developing an SUMP and also uh, they also um, decided to develop a separate uh, electric uh, mobility strategy. So this was done, uh, the, the electric, strat electric mobility strategy was uh, uh, to be implemented between 2018 and 2024, and is very interconnected with the SUMP. Um, this, uh, for example, is aligned on the objectives, on the measure, on the, on the vision and targets, right? So also it highlights that electromobility is very important in the city to improve our quality, but also it's not sufficient, right? Because it requires complementary measures. So um, it focuses on all different types of um, services. So public transport, uh, um, for example, shared uh, vehicles and private vehicles, etc. And 
very important here is the vision from this strategy, because what they want in Barcelona, they want to convert electric mobility as the preferred motorized mode. So to electrify everything, right? All the motorized uh, vehicles. And um, um, this is to, to help or to um, sh sh um, push on the transition towards a more healthy and sustainable mobility, right? And also, of course, for this to be done, the municipality needs to assume the risks of the, of the implementation of these uh, new technologies. And also, um, this will require also the private sector to change, right, to transform. But this is also part of the process that will have a, the, a better outcome in the long term. So these are important aspects that we can learn, for example, from the e-mobility strategy of Barcelona. And I think this is everything from my side now. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Katie, for this um, excellent presentation. I think that we learned quite a lot. Uh, so thanks again. Uh, I remind you that if you have any questions that you can add them in the chat and we shall address them later. So can you see my screen well and hear me well? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I will now present you um, the policies that can support the uptake of electric mobility. So first, to support the uptake of a diversity of electric vehicles that you can see here on the right hand side. Um, it's important to understand first the typical barriers that will be faced um, before uh, designing the correct policies to address such barriers. There are four typical types of barriers to electric mobility. The first type um, is about regulatory and institutional barriers, such as, for instance, the lack of coordination between um, ministries and departments, the lack of restrictions on fossil fuel vehicles, or the lack of inclusion of transport providers in policy making. Secondly, there are often um, significant economic barriers faced, such as the um, investment costs uh, for the vehicles, for the charging infrastructure, the lack of financial incentives to switch to electric vehicles, limited knowledge, for instance, on procurement, or low fuel prices or high electricity prices. Thirdly, some important technical aspects as well. Um, as my colleague uh, Katie said, um, a lack of standards and interoperability can also harm the uptake of the electric mobility market. The connection and the impact um, on the electric grid is also very often a big question mark. And finally, a lack of skill on either manufacturing vehicles um, or batteries, but also the lack of knowledge on maintenance of electric vehicles is a further aspect. And finally, um, some behavior and knowledge aspects. So for instance, uh, limited knowledge among, among the population on the health impact of um, air pollution, or also some um, anxieties regarding the range and the convenience of electric vehicles. So now I will go briefly through the policies that can help address these barriers. That can be a bit dry and a bit technical, but I would try to make it um, interactive. Um, I will address four main segments. So the vehicles, then the charging infrastructure, then the batteries, and then innovation. Um, is it possible to, yeah, for everyone to mute themselves? Thanks a lot. Um, so regarding uh, the policies, um, first, it's very important to uh, design targets for uh, the introduction of electric vehicles and the timeline for that. Um, briefly, just a practical note. So when it's here gray, it means that it's a possible policy. If it's dark green, it means that it has been adopted or implemented in Rwanda. And if it's light green, it means that here, it means that it has been partially implemented or it's adopted and that will be in the future. So after targets, a further aspect is the coordination within public institutions between the different departments as well as with the private sector and civil society. And here we see that Rwanda and Kigali are doing uh, very good progress in that regard. The planning of the deployment of electric mobility can be done through a so-called national urban mobility plan 
or at local level through these sustainable urban mobility plans that my colleague Katie just presented. Vehicle fuel efficiency standards on uh, the CO2 emissions of the vehicles can be a further aspect. And the so-called urban vehicle as access regulation, so for instance, low emission zones can help. I will explain a bit later what it is exactly. On the economic side, it's very important to reduce the gap uh, between fossil fuel vehicles and electric vehicles. That can be done through fuel taxes, excise duty, and so-called fee-based schemes, meaning taxing more the less efficient vehicles and giving rebates to more efficient vehicles. So for instance, to be done through the circulation tax, for instance. Reduced import tariffs and VAT for EVs and parts. Again, that's something where we see progress in, in Rwanda, so that, that's great. And some public financial support, for instance, for the procurement of electric buses or for uh, subsidies for uh, specifically sustainable uh, vehicles. So for instance, like in Berlin, subsidies for individuals to purchase electric cargo bikes. On the technical aspects, uh, which is a, a significant barrier, technical standards are needed, as we discussed before. Um, it can be also very interesting to support local manufacturing of vehicles and parts to make supply chain more reliable um, and to design some skill development programs for the maintenance of electric vehicles, as well as support further research and development into new or retrofitted vehicles and batteries. And finally, raising awareness among the population on electric vehicles and uh, the health impact of air pollution is very important. And here again, we see some very good progress in Kigali. So now I would like to focus on some specific measures. So first I mentioned these urban vehicle access regulations. Um, the purpose of these regulations is to, in some specific zones, to decrease carbon emissions, uh, pollutants, um, noise emissions, and they can take different forms. So for instance, here you have the low emission zones. So to allow access to vehicles, that means certain emission requirements. Um, going further, the zero emission zones that goes further, so allowing the circulation of, for instance, electric vehicles, but also uh, cyclists, pedestrians. Then parking regulations, congestion charging schemes, and limited traffic and pedestrian zones. And here also we see very good progress in Rwanda and Kigali with the uh, car-free zone, with also the restricted zone for green transport that are um, mentioned in the national transport policy and strategy. Um, some incentives can also be taken with caution. So for instance, the use of bus lanes by electric cars. Um, it's indeed an incentive implemented in some countries. So for instance, Norway or the United States. But I would like also to mention that there is not necessarily a consensus on it. So for instance, Transport for London rejected it, saying that it would have possible negative impact on the operation of public transport buses and also raising safety concerns, wondering also if there is a real impact on the sale of batteries. So here, uh, some, some caution. Now moving on to the EV charging infrastructure. The first aspect is to clarify the legal framework that applies to charging facilities and to electricity distribution companies. So for instance, is a license needed? Um, what happens to the electricity distribution companies if an individual wants to uh, charge uh, a vehicle and install charging points? Um, also, it's the question of allowing or even requesting utilities or petroleum corporations to set up charging points. Um, in that regard, there are some quite interesting um, examples from Europe or for, from India, for instance. Technical standards, again, for charging infrastructure. And as we said in the previous trainings and also with Katie, interoperability is a very important uh, aspect and should be done in discussion with the private sector as well. Finally, building code, I will mention that in a few seconds. Economic and financial aspects again. Again, here we see some very good progress in Rwanda uh, with the incentives approved in April this year with, uh, for instance, tax rebates on investment in charging equipment and on imports, reduce el electricity rates for charging. Regarding parking here, um, there are two possible, for instance, strategy. Uh, one is to have a differentiating uh, parking uh, pricing structure for electric vehicles. Another option is to make parking space that are more convenient. So for instance, nearer to places of interest to make them available to electric vehicles instead of fossil fuel vehicles. And finally, lower lease or rental price for establishing charging sites. 
Here, I would like to very briefly uh, discuss the building code because it's one of the incentives adopted in April. Um, this is a, a graphic from the ICCT, which is also a member of the Solutions Plus Consortium. And here you can see two different strategies. Um, so on one hand, it's possible to say, well, there should be a percentage of parking spaces that should be equipped with charging points in new buildings or major renovations, um, or um, there should be a percentage of buildings or spaces that are so-called EV ready, meaning um, equipped with the wiring and sufficiently electrical power for future charging points. Here again, I would like to stress that it's very important to see electric mobility within a broader sustainable urban mobility perspective. So for instance, if you decide to review the building code, it could be quite interesting to introduce minimum bicycle parking. Um, it's something that we see in Europe here, when you have, for instance, minimum bicycle parking uh, spaces that also increase the model shift for uh, cycling. So that's something further quite important. Um, and finally, on batteries and innovation, there are a couple of possible measures. So on batteries to support public-private cooperation, uh, to invest into industrialization, more reliable supply chain, more research and development. Um, and research and development, especially for the connection between the vehicles and the electrical grids in both directions. Um, and the end of life management of batteries. So you may have heard about the so-called second life of the EV batteries that can be used for energy storage purposes. But it's, it's quite nascent, so there's still a lot of research and pilots to be done there. Um, finally, on innovation, again, collaboration with the private sector is very important. And I would like to stress here, particularly cooperation with academia. It's something that we see specifically, uh, for instance, in the Netherlands, uh, where universities have an important role to collect data and to analyze it, uh, for instance, on the charging needs and the charging points. So here, coming to my conclusion, um, as you have seen in the previous slides, um, there are a lot of measures that can be taught, that can be taken at local, at the national level. So it's very important to make sure that they are properly aligned and that they also may com complete each other. Cooperation within um, public institutions is very important between the different departments and ministries, but also with the private sector and with civil society. And finally, again, it's very important to see electric mobility within a sustainable urban mobility approach, meaning the importance to uh, avoid, reduce the need for travel, to shift towards energy efficient transport modes, such as public transport and active mobility, and finally, to improve the efficiency of the technology use. So electric mobility can clearly participate to this improved component by improving the efficiency of vehicles, but it can also enable to shift, shift towards more attractive electric buses or to facilitate um, the shift towards cycling uh, with the introduction of electric bicycles. So that's the end of my presentation. That was quite a lot of information, I guess. So please don't hesitate to um, indicate in the chat if you have any questions or uh, per email, I would be very happy to answer any questions. And I would like to remind you that uh, we have done in the, in the past Africa training pr further presentations on, for instance, standards, on interoperability, on the possibility to combine charging points at the same location um, that we will also have in our policy paper on EV charging infrastructure. So don't hesitate to contact us if you would like more information. Thanks. And with this, I hand over to my colleagues, Judith Oginga and Edmund Teko for a round of questions and answers. Thank you, Emily. Um, I think I will take the first question and then hand over the second question to Edmund. The first question goes to uh, Katie and it's asked by Oluro Timi. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, and he asks, SAMP was planned with the mindset of an organized public transport with the public transport in most African countries being informal. How does the SAMP uh, process help bring the informal sector to e-mobility? Thank you, Judith. Um, I think it's an interesting question. 
Um, so I think uh, what what SUMP can do, uh, yeah, I know that uh, I mean not 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 uh, only in Africa but in other regions also we we have I think um, the problem of uh, having different service uh, providers for public transport rights, and this is a huge challenge in our cities. So um, I think in that sense, SMP what what really can do would be to align the objectives um, of uh, different planning processes, right? For example, the uh, the process of transforming the transport or from, or making it more sustainable, it's it's a common vision, and I think with the SMP we can really align all these different visions to have just one in our city, and all of them are going anyways in the same path, right? We all want uh, integrated transport, sustainable transport, more healthy transport. So what, what we can really uh, take advantage of the SUMP would be to align all of this, not only in the transport sector, but also in the energy sector and to bring all this together. And even with other sectors that also have an impact in the urban fabric in our cities. So. Once we have this aligned in a common vision, we can also, for example, the public authorities can set up um, incentives for private operators, right, uh, to shift to immobility. If they can provide the, the adequate incentives, if they can provide, for example, enough charging points, right? So this really has, has to come from the leading of the public authority to, to change this, to make this transformation and to have this overview, this big you know, uh, vision from, uh, of the city. So to provide all these necessary conditions for the transformation of immobility. So it can come from a top-down approach, but also that this, you know, from this top-down approach of the authority of the municipality, they can also help the uh, a transformation from a bottom up approach right by providing these um, conditions as i said incentives and everything so that it can change you know we can achieve this transformation i think i can i can say that great thanks a lot uh, katie for your responses we have a follow-up uh, question also for you then we will move to um, emily um, the question is this you mentioned that uh, it's important that not to leave the whole transition process to market actors, but often the market moves faster than policy process. So how can the government of Rwanda, for example, anticipate and mitigate this? So this also goes to Katie. Edmund, that was the question for me. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, if sorry, you like, I thought if, you were. <laughs> sorry, sorry, if, if you Can like, you... Uh, let me take it again. Can you? Uh, yeah, please. Thank you. You mentioned uh, not leaving the whole transition process to market actors. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said that uh, uh, it's important to, to not to leave the, the, the whole process to market actors. However, very often, the market moves faster than policy processes, as we see in many cases. So how can the government of Rwanda anticipate and mitigate this scenario or this, this situation? Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, I think that's a fact. I mean, uh, always I think the market um, uh, will, sometimes you know fulfill this uh, the user needs much more quickly right because the government sometimes uh, there are limited res limited resources um, maybe only few people working on the topic and not enough financial uh, also resources to react as quickly as as possible um, so i think that's um, that's an Im that's important to know but also in that sense i think the government i mean with everything the government can do would be to at least uh, set up well, for example, the terms and conditions 
uh, for, um, for the private operators to provide the service. I mean, I think in many municipalities, it's very difficult to really handle this themselves. I mean, to, to, to manage this, operate, do everything, right? Because it's really impossible with the capacities that are there, right? So in that sense, uh, I mean, we can give it, you know, to private, private, private providers to do it, but to set up clear uh, terms and conditions in the concessions, so that despite they are providing the service, we are still, as government, you know, checking the quality. We are still there, uh, seeing that everything is as we want. And also we can get the data, for example, and we can ensure interoperability. So I think that's very important. So that, that, that's it. that is what we mean when we say not leave it everything to the market, right? Not just say, okay, the market will solve it. And then we are just get rid of this problem, right? So at least make sure that we are still there and we can check anytime how it is going and we can make any maybe adjustments if needed but to make sure that these uh, terms and conditions are clear so that we can still uh, make you know, any adjustments if needed. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Katie. We will have one question for Emily. Uh, I'll give it to Judith. Thanks, Edmund. Um, so this is a question for Emily. Um, Emily, you talked about policies at national and local levels, but what about the regional levels? Thanks, Judith. Uh, thanks, indeed. Uh, it's, it's an excellent question. Um, the, the regional level is also very important, um, especially to discuss on possible harmonization and standards uh, within the East African community. So that's definitely a further aspect to, to consider, um, even though uh, in, in Rwanda there are different uh, socket types and also um, circulating also on the right hand side of, uh, of the road. So there are some differences, but still the regional uh, level for harmonization is very important. Um, and I think that it's not only through regional structures, but also bilateral discussions. So for instance, in Kenya, there are some interesting discussions going on uh, in terms of analy uh, analyzing uh, the, the gaps in terms of manufacturing skills and maintenance skills. But I think there is some very interesting discussion to have on these aspects, as well as, as on gender. There are also some very interesting projects in, uh, neighbor in, in countries in the region on uh, how to tie electric mobility and gender inclusive projects. Um, and finally, also looking at DAR, which is also a, a part of the Solution to First project, uh, to, to see how there they, they work on first and last mile connectivity through electric modes at the BRT station. So, um, yeah. I think that now, thanks, thanks a lot, Judith. I think now we can move on to the next presentation by FEAR. Um, so I would like to remind uh, for future pan, uh, presenters to try to stick to 10 minutes and we'll look forward to your presentation. Thanks, Sasha. Thank you, Emily. I assume everyone can hear me, see me and uh, see my screen. Perfectly. Good. Uh, so thank you all and, uh, for being here and uh, welcome to this part of the presentation about uh, public space and parking. Uh, yeah. So first, I'll, uh, I'll talk a bit about the context of the recharging infrastructure and um, the context of public space and parking in it, about limiting the use of public space and about the maximizing utilization rate of recharging infrastructure. Uh, I might be going a little bit fast sometimes because of, uh, because of the time, uh, <laughs> the stringent time limit here, but uh, uh, I hope I get uh, through it uh, without being too fast. So a little bit of context here. Um, I hope the relevance will become clear throughout the presentation, but in, uh, to summarize in one sentence, um, the par parking and charging uh, policies can increase the uptake of EVs. Um, you have here different locations on the screen where parking and charging can take place. And, and all these locations need to be taken into account when considering parking and recharging for electric vehicles. So if recharging at work, along the highway, at home, but also at, <clears throat> sorry, um, commercial locations as a mall, for instance. And this picture makes it a little bit more clear uh, what I'm talking about maybe, because every location is serving a different charging profile. 
Uh, so for instance, on the left uh, um, uh, top corner, you have charging at home. Uh, that serves a certain amount of people, uh, maybe commuters with a small distance that get charged at home overnight. But we have a utility vehicle, for instance, that is can charge overnight, but it's not sufficient to last the entire day. So then you need rapid charging as well. Um, so it's really important to take into account that you have different target groups and that it serves is served by different locations. Uh, and important to see as well is that you have private locations and you have public space locations. So charging at home, charging at the office or at a recreational uh, location, that's all private locations. But private charging in public area or uh, rapid charging, those are examples of uh, charging in the public space. And there needs to be a good combination of both to serve all the different charging profiles. And the last thing I want to say about this is that you can really, um, as an authority, also uh, choose what you want to serve. So for instance, if you want to have utility vehicles that, uh, uh, that I just mentioned, then the rapid charging might be uh, something to incentivize or to implement more, uh, more sooner than um, private charging in public areas. These are all levers you can, uh, you can play with. Also in the context, it's important that there are lots of challenges for public parking and recharging for electric vehicles. Um, just a couple of examples here. Um, the, the public space use is a challenge, uh, except, uh, ex exceptionally is the, uh, the, the acceptance uh, for policies. So you can, for instance, have designated parking areas for EVs with charges. Um, yeah, but people can get irritated by that. You see a picture there of uh, being iced. Um, a seemingly irritated uh, user of a, a combustion engine uh, vehicle blocking, I think, uh, around six uh, superchargers for Teslas there. Um, you need to build awareness and need to build uh, acceptance of these policies. That's really important. Um, the second one is in, uh, in the public space use is the signs. So if you want to designate areas for EV parking, uh, it needs to be properly announced uh, and people need to know about this because otherwise you designate these areas and it's not being used. Uh, and the third one there, uh, third example, is that you have also designated areas where you have a charger, um, but it can be used as a normal parking space by uh, drivers of an electric vehicle. Uh, in Dutch, we actually have a, a separate words for this because it's uh, very common. Uh, you see a picture there of Amsterdam, and you have recharging points, uh, and it's actually meant to recharge, not to park your car there for the entire week. Um, but laadpaalklever, that's the Dutch word of... Uh, sticking to your charging pole without recharging. Um, yeah, that's, that's also a really important issue. And all these challenges need to be uh, uh, managed. But next to that, you also have the grid costs um, be coming to you for, uh, because of a higher demand for electricity and a, a new technologies, technologies coming uh, along the way as well. And the importance of the grid, of course, increases with uh, the increase of EVs and increase of recharging infrastructure. And the last point I'd like to touch upon here is the, the business case. So you have, um, you can either choose for maximum capacity of utilization of a recharging point that reduces the cost of that recharging point. Um, due to the utilization, you can sell more electricity uh, during a day, but that decreases the user convenience. Uh, there isn't an abundance of chargers. And I just saw a question about uh, in the chat about the chicken or egg with the uh, uh, electric vehicles or recharging infrastructure. Maybe if you go for a maximum capacity utilization at the beginning, it becomes difficult for new people to buy an EV. So this, these are all difficult challenges for, uh, for people to manage. Okay, now I want to go to the second point, the limiting use of public space. And yeah, why is this an important issue, limiting the use of public space? Um, well, the simple answer is that public space is scarce and the recharging infrastructure takes up some of this space. Uh, and there is an increase. We see this uh, everywhere uh, of electric cars, light electric vehicles, electric light delivery vehicles, electric buses, and maybe even uh, in the future, other electric vehicles that aren't even on the market uh, yet as of today. Combine that with uh, increased rates of um, urbanization means that managing public space becomes really important. And you can manage in public, public space or the use of public space by recharging and parking infrastructure uh, through a higher utilization. Um, so what do we mean by that? Uh, you see here a picture of a map of, uh, of Kigali and we have three red circles all indicating 
um, possible locations of high demand for parking and recharging. Um, I don't know exactly if these are uh, indeed the right locations to choose, but these can be possible locations. So for instance, the parking location on the right, um, if it's a big parking location, you're bound to have larger amounts of uh, electric vehicles there. So it would be wise to have also uh, recharging and parking for EVs there, um, meaning that if you have sufficient charging and recharging there, the utilization rate is high because you have a lot of vehicles there. And if chargers are, have a have high utilization rate, it means that you need less recharging infrastructure in the city center. Um, so you reduce the use of public space there, but also if you place them correctly, uh, for instance, on the left-hand side, you see locations of public transport combined with um, e-bikes, uh, you can increase the multi-modality of, uh, of travel. And that's, of course, also a really interesting one. Um, just here, a short slide on this. Um, if you make smart combinations of different types of vehicles that increases the, the utilization rate uh, of recharging and parking. So charging hubs in cities can be for all kinds of electric vehicles from e-scooters to tuks to public transport, swapping stations for e-scooters, for instance, and even for battery storage uh, that increases the utilization and uh, reduces the use of public space. There's a second way in which you can use to reduce the use of public space. And that is by incentivizing the charging and the recharging and parking on private grounds. So again, the map of Kigali, but uh, a bit wider, a bit zoomed out. Um, the indicators, the blue indicators uh, are placed on interesting places that people are visit, uh, visit often. You could, as government to institute, uh, opt for incentivizing these locations, for instance, a mall or a hotel or a cinema or any other location to place recharging infrastructure uh, on their own grounds, uh, meaning that it's, again, reducing the use of public space because it's private ground, it's not public space. Um, it reduces the cost for governments because these companies will have no business, their own business model need to uh, finance it themselves. Um, you can, of course, choose uh, also with the chicken and egg uh, um, uh, problem there to incentivize this, but the costs are going to be lower. It does, however, give uh, less of governmental control. And that's going to be important for the next part of this, uh, what I want to talk about, and that is maximizing the utilization rate of recharging infrastructure. So already discussed a little bit why utilization rate is important because it reduces the use of public space, but there are more factors that are important. So here it's defined as the occupancy rate and the occupancy rate is defined as the share of time during, during which vehicles are effectively recharging at a recharging point. So it doesn't mean being parked at an EV recharging station, that, but actually the time that they're recharging there. Uh, and I mentioned this earlier that uh, in the Netherlands, we have a word for being parked there and not even recharging. Uh, this is a big problem uh, in, uh, in, in some cities. Um, but getting the occupancy rate right gives you a couple of outcomes, a couple of benefits. Um, so again, you reduce the use of public space. Also, you reduce the use uh, the installation and maintenance costs. If you have fewer recharging points, you have free, fewer installations, they will cost you less if your maintenance also costs you less. And that directly links to the reduced investment costs as well. There are two uh, main streams of policies you can follow there. Those are the restrictions on the use of EV-enabled parking lots by non-EVs. And second, the different parking rates for EV-enabled parking lots. I'll, uh, I'll give examples for both. So first, restricting the use of EV-enabled parking lots. So basically, um, having dedicated parking places for just for electric vehicles. And you have three different levels for this. So first is a parking lot can only be used by, by an electric vehicle while it is recharging effectively. So if it's full, it needs to be moved. The second one, second level is a bit lower, a bit more stringent. It's a parking place only for electric vehicles, but it doesn't matter if they're recharging or not. And the third level is a parking place for EVs, uh, an EVPL stands for electric vehicle parking lot, uh, but it is allowed for uh, vehicles with a combustion engine also to park there in certain situations or certain time periods, as the example there shows. And here I have two, uh, two examples uh, from the Netherlands. 
actually uh, from my colleague Ethan and uh, myself in front of our houses. On the left-hand side, you see a, uh, a sign that says that if your electric vehicle there is fully charged and it's between 8 a.m. and 10 p.m., you need to move your car, otherwise you can get a fine. On the right-hand side, you see uh, that there's a sign. It just says uh, only electric vehicles, but no other restrictions. So you see often here right in front of my house that people char charge their car and just leave it there because it's convenient not to move it for five days. Um, so that reduces the occupancy rate of recharges in the city. And it looks like there are trees in, in the background, but it's really close to the city center. So the occupancy rate there is really important. Then the second um, direction for policies, the different parking rates for EV enabled parking. And so that again, three different levels. So if free, par free parking, uh, so you only pay for the electricity, but you don't pay any parking fee. You have regular parking rates. So the cost for electricity consumed is, uh, is being uh, applied to the, uh, to the EV user, but also the parking rates. And then you have uh, the third level is a uh, progressive parking rate. So you start to um, pay more for your parking fee uh, as you stand, uh, you, you're at a place for a longer period of time. And there are combinations of this possible, which we see in the oh, Netherlands. Um, so you have progressive parking during the day and you have free or regular parking overnight. And there's an example of this as well. In Amsterdam in the beginning, they had they needed to have an incentive for electric vehicles, so they offered free parking for it. After that, uh, the EVs increased, so they moved it a little bit to the second option, to regular parking. Uh, and uh, in the future, there's always, already talked about, I think, about some pro progressive parking fees um, during the day uh, to limit the, um, to increase the occupancy rate of the recharges. And the last thing I want to touch upon real brief, uh, looking at the time as well, is that um, the EV charging, uh, parking and recharging infrastructure also gives opportunities for innovative um, technologies. And one thing is uh, that's being uh, really innovative and yields a lot of uh, uh, possibilities for renewable energy is the vehicle to grid uh, recharging. For the ones that are not familiar with this, um, that means that uh, a vehicle is not only charged through the grid, but can also deliver energy back to it. So you see the image on the right-hand side. Um, we have peaks in our electricity consumption. Um, and when we have renewable energy, it's diff more difficult to deliver power um, when we don't have on the off time, basically, of so solar and wind power. Uh, and we can use electric vehicles to deliver energy back. Just one thing I want to... Uh, touch upon as well, because it's really important also in your, your parking and recharging uh, infrastructure. Uh, that was it. And I uh, uh, would be happy to answer uh, any of your questions uh, in a bit. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Sasha, for uh, this very instructive uh, presentation with a lot of input. I see we have already one question. Um, we will take all the questions after the presentation on the e-buses and on the e-bicycles. So please keep your question and um, add them in the chat. We will address them um, afterwards. So now, Aida, please, the, the floor is yours for a 10-minute presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. And good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you. Just let me know if uh, my slides are on the screen. I guess so. Yes, I think it's taken a yeah. bit. Now, now we have it. So, yes, it's my pleasure to be here with you today. I think uh, we have already covered, my, my colleagues in the panel have already covered uh, part of the, uh, yeah, of the uh, most relevant information I also wanted to share with you. We have seen uh, um, mostly no? so an overview also for electric buses um, for electric cars so private cars and how how the uh, the relevance now of the charging infrastructure impacts on, on on this on the public space now i would like to give you uh, some uh, some notes no? on what happens when we develop uh, electric bus fleets in our cities indeed uh, as part of the um, as part of the uh, mobility plans of a city of the energy transition plans is most importantly today, you know, when we see that in Europe, but not only in different regions of the world, this is 
one of the uh, one of the top priorities now in the uh, in the policy agenda. Um, just first, let me just explain if some of you are not uh, are not still uh, yeah familiar with uh, with UATP. UATP is International Association of Public Transport. Uh, our mission is to enhance uh, quality of life and economic well-being uh, by promoting you know, sustainable transport in cities and advocating for a better, more inclusive and sustainable transport. So we are uh, active in uh, yeah, more than uh, 100, uh, 14 uh, regional offices. We do have 1,800 members from 100 countries around the world. So this uh, provides us a very nice uh, overview of what is going on in the sector and we have among our our members operators transport authorities but also of course policy decision makers research institutes the industry you now the public transport supply and service industry team uh, but other other stakeholders as well so basically what we do is of course as i said no so we are the voice of public transport uh, we advocate uh, to 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 yeah to promote you no know, the uh, uh, to raise awareness among decision makers uh, on, on measures and, and, uh, yeah, and projects supporting and favoring public transport. Uh, we, of course, network with other, with other uh, institutions, with other colleagues in the field just to make this, uh, this uh, happen. And one of the things that I believe is the most relevant, uh, at least uh, for me as, as part of the Knowledge and Innovation Department in the BAS unit, is indeed uh, to elicit knowledge no? through, through projects, uh, cooperation projects like Solutions Plus, but many others. Um, this uh, enables us to have a, a quite, quite a holistic uh, view on what the sector is, is currently doing and what are the future needs as well. So if we start with, uh, with the question, what does it mean no? to electrify uh, the public transport bus fleets for a city? So I think the most uh, the most important is, is is to focus the attention on what what happens now when uh, when we assess the environmental and uh, challenge we are facing today. It's well known by everyone. We talk about uh, pollution, health severity, uh, air pollution in in many of our cities. We have also noise problems, of course, traffic congestion, etc. So we clearly see that even uh, even after no that the positive effects uh, on, on traffic congestion during the, the lockdown, during this, this pandemic, at least in Europe, uh, we still have not uh, sized this, this opportunity to, to really make uh, congestion in our cities uh, yeah, a, a bit less, uh, less pressing. We see also that uh, societal uh, benefits arise from, from decarbonization, not the decarbonization of public transport, not only, but of course, mobility in general. Um, we see benefits on citizens' health, not just because of the improvement, the, the clear improvement in, in, air uh, in the air quality in our cities, but also uh, on, on the different aspects that relate to the use of public transport. So when we promote also more active modes, uh, like uh, biking, uh, cycling, uh, walking, etc., we have a combination of uh, mobility modes that definitely support uh, better uh, physical condition in, in the users. Also, when we talk about electric buses, especially we see that the working conditions now of the drivers uh, improve because we have less uh, less vibrations in the vehicle itself, but also, of course, the, the exhaust fumes of the, provided by the, by the technology itself. What happens also when when a city decides to go for, for electric uh, bus fleets, of course, that's an opportunity you know, to, to improve the, the image of the urban bus. This, this, uh, this technology, zero emission technologies, uh, provide you know, a, a high uh, innovation, comfort, and environmental friendliness, which is improving definitely the, uh, the image of the city and it its attractiveness, and also allows us to rethink the system from a perspective of an optimization, not just of the network itself, perhaps, but also the operational uh, the operational procedures. Um, I think also, especially now in hopefully the post-pandemic period, is again an opportunity to gain uh, passenger, uh, passengers back uh, to public transport. We have seen that ridership uh, levels have decreased across the globe, and uh, more or less now we see that 
the highest uh, recover rate, I should say, accounts for, uh, in the best of the cases, 80%. So we still have a, um, a way to go here and make, um, make our passengers coming back to public transport. Also, I think uh, the electrification means for cities that we need to report, you not know, to strengthen the cooperation with the public sector. That's also an opportunity to improve, you know, to discuss together what is this uh, interplay and the interface between the bus and the city. And indeed, uh, I wanted to share with you here, you see uh, the, uh, the design chart for innovative electric buses uh, developed uh, within another research and innovation project, uh, the EBSF2 project. I include you the link where uh, a group of designers together with, uh, with the bus manufacturers developed some guidelines, some recommendations, not how this redesign and bus and uh, bus stops uh, could look like, not to take this opportunity uh, of improving the image of the urban bus, with uh, the attractiveness of the city. Sometimes it's funny to see that uh, very often there is no difference between a conventional diesel bus, for instance, and an electric bus. So the question here was also if we can make it uh, a diff we can make it different, no? recognizable also for the passengers, then it can be also an incentive no? to test, to, to write, to be uh, more environmental aware about uh, yeah, the benefits of uh, this new technology. Um, challenges. Um, so my colleagues have already mentioned some, uh, some of them, if not any. I think uh, Emily covered very nicely uh, the, uh, the the main uh, the main challenges we we face when we uh, when we talk about electrification of, of any any fleet. In this case, I will just focus on on the buses, but. Yes, indeed, we have a uh, higher investment costs, especially uh, in the uh, in the upfront costs, no? the capex. Uh, we talk, I think this is important always to, to underline that we are talking about um, a complete uh, shift from vehicle procurement to system procurement, which implies three different elements. We will not only purchase vehicles, we are also purchasing a charging system, and we are also impacting the operations because we will need to rethink uh, the complete uh, the complete operation in a way that it's allocated the operational needs also set by the city, but also the uh, the different uh, needs that arise from a new technology. You know, for this I think it was also very interesting. Yesterday we had we had one of our colleagues in the panel just showing how uh, this uh, this question also no of the additional vehicles will I need additional vehicles when I shift from uh, internal combustion engines to uh, to electric power trucks uh, well sometimes you will need them but I think yesterday the, inter the interesting point is that the examples if I am not wrong were uh, were showing uh, a, a concrete uh, charging strategy meaning uh, a manual uh, Black, let's say slow charging. Of course, this is why I mentioned here that um, the number of vehicles you will need, of course, the number of chargers, uh, how much space you will need in the depot, uh, additional space, or the power supply, uh, of course, depends very much on the operational conditions and very much on the choice of the technology. So based on this, initial pre-assessment, you should be able then to understand which is the solution that is fitting the best, no? Your operational conditions, your space uh, limitations, etc. Um, of course, during the operation of it, no, we see that we have other costs, like uh, what happens, no? When I charge in different uh, times of the day, uh, of course, I will have uh, yeah, higher or uh, lower uh, energy bill costs uh, for the maintenance as well. And of course, for the provision of new skills to your staff, it's um, it's something we will see at the end of the uh, of the presentation a bit. But let me go quickly. It was mentioned already uh, how important is standardization and interoperability to ensure that we can charge different buses from different makes, of course, within the same technology, uh, with the same uh, charging infrastructure. So we don't have. A system which is let's say growing and it's not usable uh, among the different players. Um, we have seen that we need uh, when we talk about large scale uh, de development, we do need high power fast charging. And right now, it's possible to charge electric buses up to 600 kilowatts. Also, um, one of the challenges um, that we are exploring in, in another of the projects I will show you later is the Assured project is. Um, 
what happens when I when I use uh, this high uh, high power fast charging technologies. What happens on battery life and what happens on the grid stability? Also, we see we will have to operate in a different way, as I said before. Uh, for this, we have uh, we have uh, today in the market available uh, smart energy management and charging strategies. Uh, we focus now rather than the vehicle level. We of course upscale to the fleet level. This is what enables us to go for larger fleets, and at the same time we uh, make use of smart IT tools, no IT intelligence, uh, to optimize fleet operation. Um, as I said, we go from uh, vehicle procurement to system procurement. This means a lot of the new uh, players are involved. This has been highlighted along all presentations I've been uh, listening to since I started working in this topic. So it's really important to have everyone on board, especially in this case, because there might be um, specific local conditions that can be addressed in a way that enables a fair uh, split of the technological risk. This said, especially for battery buses. If um, today we, we, uh, we want to talk about uh, a large scale, it's important to, to mention that the technology is mature, but still there might be operational conditions, local specific conditions that require a good assessment among, among the stakeholders. No? Um, this is already uh, yeah, completing my, my last point here. So in order to ensure that the project is going to be successful, we need to have everyone on board, ensuring uh, the right project governance, but also uh, one of the main points when it comes, especially for cities, uh, considering that today we focus on, on the role of the cities as well, is to back up, to back up the, the project with, uh, with all the support that the political and policy making side can, can do. Um, main question when we talk about the deployment of charging infrastructure for peace, when, how, and where can I charge my fleet? No, uh, this is a, this is the main question because just as a reminder, one thing is the charging technology and another thing is the charging strategy. So this said is just a reminder to understand that uh, the technology is specifically uh, chosen based on the initial requirements I mentioned before. No, for instance, how much depot uh, surface do I have available? Also, can I charge along the route or do I need to restrict the charging infrastructure to the, uh, to the depot uh, location? This will uh, basically uh, determine how we afterwards going to operate because accordingly to the opportunities, the chances, you know, how I'm going to charge, I will be able to go either for, and this is when the charging strategies come into play. This is a different way that I can choose to charge my, my fleet according to the technology. Um, do I charge overnight? And this means do I charge, for example, with a manual flag, slow charging at the depot? Do I have the opportunity to uh, charge along the route or even at the depot, but during my operation? This is called opportunity charging. Or can I play with a combination of both? No? Here in the next slide, I give you just uh, some, uh, yeah, some key points, what it's uh, overnight, the main features no? for overnight and, uh, over, sorry, opportunity and overnight charging, indeed. Um, overnight is mostly also called slow charging, it's low power mostly, and it takes hours. We talk about hours. Uh, when we talk basically also through a manual flag, when we talk about opportunity charging, we, we, call, we talk about short charging, high power fast charging. This is what normally you implement, of course, along the route, but even also at the depot, if you happen to have a depot close to, to one of the ends, for instance, no, of your operational line. This is why I mentioned before, it's really important to understand your operational conditions and what are the, let's say, the features in your city that allow you uh, to play with the system in a way that you can you can uh, yeah, decide where and how to charge. You know? um, yes, impact uh, on, of the charging infrastructure on urban space. So what are the key aspects that we need to consider, especially from the, from the, from the view of the city? So the deployment of infrastructure, colleagues of here have also uh, highlighted it, is going to, to, to compete, let's say, you know, for a scarce uh, public space already. Already, this is uh, this is the correct set. 
when we uh, when we talk about uh, this deployment infrastructure, we need we need to think what is going to be this interface I mentioned at the beginning between the bus and the urban infrastructure, and of course this is going to result. Uh, in a better integrated mobility uh, offer, and it's going to improve quality of life. So if we, as our colleagues uh, have already underlined, if we have an holistic and uh, an integrated approach from the very beginning for this, also the SUMP plans that Katie presented at the beginning is very important. It's going to give us the chance to, uh, to have a, an optimized, no? uh, in, integrated uh, charging infrastructure for our fleets. The impact on the on the public space, basically. So when we talk about new infrastructures, we do need a uh, new space for the charging points. The, the question of the location and the design of the depots, as I said before, is really important. We have it already examples like in the city of Paris, no, where Eratoke is is um, taking advantage of the uh, electric buses. Is going uh, is has already uh, planned some uh, mixed use buildings. So the depots are. On the uh, on the ground floor of another kind of buildings, and these buildings can be used for other purposes as well. So no having it, exhaust fumes, of course, uh, facilitates a lot uh, having uh, new ideas for location of buses depots. When we uh, when we need to charge um, not um, at the depot for opportunity uh, for opportunity charging, this is going to facilitate it a lot. Also, when we talk about the design of the bus stops, also the the, uh, the parking areas and the terminal looks, but of course also the accessibility, no, uh, for other modes. Uh, when we uh, occupy, let's say, public space with uh, with a charging station, we also need to comply with different regulations and make sure that other modes are also uh, entitled to to share and to use the public space as uh, as it was the case. I will then just highlight what is uh, the benefits of uh, considering sharing uh, infrastructure for energy supply. Here is an example of the electric project where we saw that it's possible, and this is already implemented by by some operators uh, running uh, trolley buses and in motion charging trolley buses. You can, of course, take advantage of existing uh, electric infrastructure. In this case, uh, you can see in the pictures a bus. Charging uh, next to your, next to the line of, of a tram, I uh, yeah, I recommend you the policy uh, yeah, to read the recommendations of the electric project. Um, I will skip this uh, because it's basically yeah what what we need to consider when we do plan and design the system when we operate and we uh, we need to provide uh, training skills uh, on the safety aspects, but also on how we uh, work with uh, this new technology for, for our staff, for drivers, maintenance staff. And just let me go quickly through the examples, and I will try to sum up the recommendations that you can read afterwards in, in the final slides in these um, in these pictures. So here you see uh, what I what I wanted to make is just give you some visual examples uh, of some charging infrastructure, which is already placed in public space here. I think that's a very innovative uh, and a very innovative uh, result of, of the ABSF2 project where uh, they developed an indoor bus stop. This indoor bus stop is, is in, in Gothenburg, is in the uh, Lindholmen uh, Center. And you can see it's completely uh, an, an indoor space. Uh, this has been very appreciated, very much appreciated by the passengers because uh, for climate conditions, it's quite quite uh, yeah, convenient to have uh, to have the indoor space uh, um, bus stop. But uh, basically this opens the question, okay, there is other locations that can be also indoors, like for instance, um, hospitals or uh, arriving to main uh, university centers. Where you can you can consider these um, these stops here. Some examples how different charging infrastructures uh, ideas look like. Uh, I have uh, put here different examples of uh, Panto up and Panto down. So here uh, you can see how this looks like. This here, by the way, is flash charging. Uh, it's I think it's a it's a nice example because that's uh, that's the infrastructure used in in Nantes in France uh, by by the Ibus uh, highway operated by Semitan, and and the good thing is that the pantograph here you can see it is also like a pantograph one but 
it has this range, let's say, no, of tolerance when it comes to the docking for the charging. Some examples, but happens. So basically what I would like to highlight here is that it's important as a city to provide some guidelines on the visual identity of your city, for instance, no? So this is, uh, of course, also compliant with the co uh, corporate identity of the, of the bus operator. But as a city, you can indeed uh, provide some, um, some guidance to, to the operators and the charging solution suppliers. This is uh, your space. You can no? definitely uh, give a hand and cooperate on how you would like it to look like. Another uh, technology that is interesting when it comes to avoid no, on the surface, we, do, we have seen uh, charging infrastructure on the surface, now we go beneath the surface. So here we have two examples, one is conductive ground based charging here, uh, where the, uh, the system is also like tiny pantographs emerging from the ground, here it's the security uh, barrier that comes up when the bus has placed himself. And this is an example, here you can see how it works. This, this other is an example both in, in London operated by TFL and uh, in Madrid, operated by uh, EMT Madrid, also uh, Partners of Solutions Plus, where uh, they are testing and operating with wireless inductive charging. All this, these are the projects that you can reach out uh, to learn more about these uh, examples, but all this shows the different technologies that we can consider when it comes to the uh, to the operation uh, to the deployment of uh, of charging infrastructure. The most important for cities recommendations for cities back up back up the mobility project uh, the e mobility project from the very beginning. This means put your mobility strategy in your mobility plans together with all stakeholders. Make sure that uh, everyone is involved and everyone is participating in the path in the in the process of the planning and the building up and the operation design. Um, space needs, as I said before, is uh, one of the main uh, of the main factors you will need to to discuss and support also your your uh, bus operator operators uh, in order to identify um, suitable spaces in terms of power supply, but also available space. Um, standardization, if you plan today to be uh, able to, to have a standardized uh, charging infrastructure, you can also integrate other modes. We have seen this in the presentation of Sotati. And yeah, again, another main message, close cooperation required, as I said before. Um, one of the things that is less mentioned, I tried to highlight it at the beginning, is that the positive externalities, of course, of electric mobility on health, citizen and society as a whole, it's, it's something that we also need to consider in this, um, in this interplay. So my last message in with this, I, I finished. Technology is there, is mature, and the knowledge exists already. So now it is really time to exchange with peers. It's really time to, to make our plans, to set up the, uh, the uh, strategies we need to follow and deploy. These are some examples of, uh, of the projects that are working in the field for you to have a look. And I really thank you for, for your attention today. I say uh, I remain available for your questions. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, um, Aida, for this great presentation with a lot of very interesting input. Um, now we go briefly to a presentation on electric bicycles uh, by, from Chris Scott from ITDP. Great, thanks, Emily. And it's good to be with everyone for the second day of the training. So we wanted to cover e-bike share as the one of the final e-mobility modes and talk about some of the recent findings from Chinese cities in how these systems are performing and, and really some of the differences between the usage of e-bike share and, and regular bike share. Um, so the, the material in this presentation mainly draws on two recent reports. So there's this 2021 China Principal Cities report that, that has a pretty large um, sample size of different cities across the country. And the, the second report, the, the Travel Watch report from last year, which covers three cities you can see on the right here. And both of these reports have some interesting insights on the, the travel patterns. So one of the first findings is that the, as you might expect, the trip distances are much higher for, for e-bike share. So on average, regular bikes are, are used for an average trip distance of about two kilometers. 
and but for for e-bikes it's it's three kilometers and and so there's a very significant um, increase in the in the trip distances. The time spent cycling is also higher. Um, so it's it's not just that the the e-bikes are helping people make the same trip faster, but they're making much longer trips, and and so they they end up spending even more time. Um, cycling. So I think what this points to is that the, the e-bikes are, are almost replacing um, other motorized modes um, as opposed to the regular bike share, which might be serving more last mile trips and, um, you know, and perhaps short, short trips that people otherwise would have done by walking. But the e-bike share by comparison, you know, might be replacing more of the public transport trips. So here you can see the, the trips of 20 minutes, uh, well, 20 minutes or more um, per day um, in, in dark green that, that people are doing with the e-bikes. Um, another finding is that in terms of when you look at trip timings during the day, um, there, there are these small peaks in early morning and evening. And, and so this might reflect the fact that bus service is more limited at those hours. And so the e-bike share is able to increase mobility at those timings when it's hard for people to find alternatives. Sample size of the three cities in the second report. So again, you can see the, the significant difference in the trip time and, and travel distance and, and a, a slight increase in, in speeds. Um, and then here we have the, the distribution um, uh, in terms of the, the trip distance. And, and you can see the, you know, that the e-bikes the e have a much longer uh, tail um, because people are taking them further. Um, here's the distribution of the instantaneous speed. So you can see that with, with regular bike share, there's this range from about seven to 14 kilometers per hour where most people are riding and there are very few people cycling at higher speeds. Whereas with the e-bikes, you have a, a, a much wider distribution um, with a lot of people uh, traveling, you know, upwards of 20 kilometers per hour for portions of their trips, okay? And then one of the really interesting findings is the, the distribution of trip origins and destinations. And, and so here's one comparison where you can see the distribution for regular bike share and for the, the, the shared e-bikes. And you can see that a lot of the e-bike trips are, are concentrated more on the arterial roads. So again, pointing to the, the idea that they're, they're serving more as a substitute for these longer distance trips that other, otherwise people would have taken by vehicle, whereas the regular bike share is used more to get into the neighborhoods, um, say, if you're, if you're using it as, as last mile access. So finally, on the, in terms of the, um, the docking facilities, because this is a question that's come up in, in Kigali in terms of what, you know, what, what kind of charging facilities make, would make most sense for bike share. And, and so one, one option that's used um, is to have the station where bikes need to be docked at the station to charge. Um, but the other more common option in, in Chinese cities is, is to follow battery swapping um, where, where the staff move around to, uh, to change the batteries in the bikes. And, and so here's the comparison um, of, of those two alternatives. Um, with, you know, with docking stations, you, you save on on uh, labor costs, but you end up having much higher infrastructure costs because you need to bring electrical connections to all those stations. And if you follow the swapping arrangement, you, you usually systems have slightly larger batteries um, because the time between charge is, is usually longer. And, but then you, you save a lot of money in terms of not having to develop these, these um, extensive physical stations. So uh, that, you know, that's been adopted by, by most cities. Um, they're using the, the swapping solutions, whereas a smaller number um, have, have gone for the docking stations. And there, there are several business models for these charging facilities. So um, in, in some cases, the, the operator is handling the, the system from start to finish. Um, so some companies where the, the same bike share operator will, will handle the bike share operations, but also the charging and, and maintenance and battery swapping. 
Um, but there are also some other arrangements where, similar to what we discussed yesterday with, with uh, e-buses, where companies are partnering with energy utilities, which then handle the battery swapping and charging. Um, and then there can also be arrangements where the, the bike share operator is, is a different entity from the operator who's managing the charging station. Um, so it just points to the, you know, that there are different possible models. And hopefully as we're, we're looking at introducing the bike, the e-bike share in, in Kigali, some of these insights would, would help us plan the system there. So thanks. Um, I hope I haven't taken too much time and we can take further questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Chris. A lot of great uh, insights from uh, the Chinese experience. So thanks a lot. Um, we will now take only one or two questions as the time is running and we want to have some, some time for the panel session. So please, um, Edmund and Judith, over to you for a few questions. Thanks. Thanks, Emily. Um, I think we will take um, the first question, which was asked by Alan Quelly. And he asked, um, how would the private sector monetize charging infrastructure, keeping in mind some private investors are waiting for the number of EVs to reach a critical mass to invest in infrastructure? It's kind of a chicken egg problem. And I think this question was directed to Sasha. Yeah. Yeah, I saw this, this question was already asked, I think, before the presentation. So uh, I saw it and it, it yeah, that's, that's a known problem. And I don't think there is a, there's one remedy for it. Um, so it's, it's a good problem. It's, it's a, a good thing that you already keep this thing in mind. Um, you could think of uh, the thing I mentioned about having recharging infrastructure incentivized in public spaces to the investors that are, that are mentioned getting some tax breaks and tax rebates, uh, things like that, um, to incentivize them to start with recharging infrastructure. And uh, yeah, for them also to see that the, the possibility, you hope that they will see the possibilities of uh, the growing uh, EVs in the, in the city, um, but it, it remains a difficult point. And we see that uh, I think around the globe that uh, the, the, the starting phase is a little bit difficult, but once it ramps up, ramps up you see, if he's growing, then you see infrastructure growing, and then again, if he's growing. Um, so that might not be a satisfactory answer, but uh, that's that's all I can give uh, for now. Just, just to compliment on, on Sasha's, uh, if it's one, one second. Um, I think rather than trying to understand how many vehicles we are going to deploy with, because I think now we talk about private cars, it would be more convenient. We have seen fantastic examples, methodologies, and uh, it's, it's highlighted by all the colleagues. You need to talk with the city as a private operator as well and see what is the strategy. If things are not implemented in the city strategy, it's going to be quite difficult to deploy. And actually, at the end, what we don't want is to have a fragmented market. What do, what do we want is to have a complementation no, of different modes supported supporting each other and in my in my view what it's definitely a must is that we try to reduce the number of vehicles moving in the city thing we try to keep public transport as the backbone of the, of the mobility system in a city so just talk with the city talk with the stakeholders and develop a joint strategy i think that would be my my message thank you and regarding this uh, question on multimodal stations or actually combine uh, charging points in the same location. We have some information in our uh, upcoming uh, policy advice paper, so you will be able to find information uh, there as well. Um, so thanks a lot uh, to all the presenters for uh, these really great uh, presentations. Uh, now we, we have learned quite a lot about the different uh, policies strategies, vehicle types, and now we want to raise the question of what comes next in, in Kigali. It's a great uh, panel session, and I think that you can see my screen, right? Please tell me. Yes, we can. Very good. Thanks, Francois, for being here already. Very briefly, I would like just to acknowledge the fact that uh, Rwanda has taken a very efficient and progressive approach towards electric mobility, as you can see here. Uh, with first a feasibility study complemented by targets on uh, mitigation uh, within the updated NDC paper, 
um, as well as targets for the penetration of electric vehicles in the national transport uh, policy and strategy, completed by incentives in April this year and soon an action plan. So congratulations for this very efficient uh, process that also took place in a very enabling policy environment with transport regulation, transport reforms, uh, a focus on transit-oriented development, car-free day, car-free zones, and the uh, restricted zones for green tra transport announced in the national policy and strategy. So with this, I hand over to our colleagues Francois Zirikana from the city of Kigali and Chris Cost from ITDP to moderate, to introduce the panel and to moderate the panel session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emilia. I think you can hear me. So yes, we we'll be having we we'll be having a panel of uh, so far I have a four panelists. I will be checking on each panelist if your camera is uh, working. We will be putting on your camera. So Janvier, can you hear me? Yes, I do hear you, Francois. Okay, good, good. This is Janvier coming from the Ministry of Infrastructure. We have a Patrick. Patrick, can you hear me? Patrick from Morura. Yes, uh, Francois. Thank you. I can get your voice very well. Okay. Thank you very much. Dr. Alphonse, can you hear me? Yes, Francis. Very well. Okay, good, 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 good. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll be uh, checking again if for Innocent, University from the UDCL. Innocent, can you hear us? Possibly our mic is, 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 is muted. Anyway, thank you very much. We, we can be checking on him on the phone. We can start. Uh, Chris, are you, are you with us? Yes, yes, hi, Francois. Hi, 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 hi. So thank you very much, everyone, for participating. This is a very important training. We'll be having this panel and we'll be asking some questions and you feel free, free to ask even questions in, in, in the chat. So we, I, I will start by asking the first question to the Minister of Infrastructure. Uh, I think Janvier can inform me very well. Janvier, we, we, we have been reviewing the transport policy approved this year and the target for for e-mobility are somehow gross. There are no segregation between staples of vehicles. Are you planning to put it in, in other planning documents or, or something to, to be specific, saying, for example, cars, percentage of cars, percentage of uh, bus, some, uh, percentage of motorcycles? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, moderator, for giving us time to um, clarify on some of the aspects that were not uh, uh, indicated in the transport policy that has been approved back in April this year. Uh, as you know, the policy cannot cover, uh, it's just give uh, major headlines, but guidelines on what needs to be done. Actually, as per the question that you are asking, yeah, we are, we are envisaging to uh, develop a national transport master plan whereby all those targets um, and the other aspects of concern will be uh, put to indicate the development of the uh, subsectors. But uh, just to make you know, and all the other participants that are following us, we have conducted a study back in 2018, a study that we conducted with, in, in a partnership with uh, UNEP, uh, uh, and the KFW, uh, the study, uh, we wanted to know uh, or to uh, investigate uh, how to introduce electric mobility in Rwanda. The consultant uh, within its, uh, I mean, uh, the consultant did a, a great job, which provide insight uh, on policy making and uh, introduction of electric vehicles. And uh, with the projections and various considerations made, they came up with some um, targets uh, on every categories of vehicles. Actually, the study looked at the electric buses, 
uh, motorcycles and cars in general. If I can give you a few of uh, the, the, the projected uh, targets that the study came, came, came out with on the electric buses, the consulting team uh, indicated that uh, the, 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 the indicative minimum share uh, is set to 2.3 percent in 2023-2024, meaning around, I mean, for sorry, for um, uh, for buses, it was set at 1 percent, which means around 40 uh, e-buses in 20, uh, 23, 24, uh, wife is set at 20% of the, the total freight in 20, uh, 29, 30. That was the, the, the minimum indicative share for electric buses. Uh, for the cars, we had 0.2%, uh, uh, meaning uh, this corresponds to around 300 vehicles. Uh, in 2023, 2024, and uh, about 8% in 2019, 2029, 30 fiscal year. Uh, and then on motorcycles, as I said, uh, the consulting team came up with a number of 2.3%, uh, corresponding to about 3,200 uh, motor electric motorcycles. Uh, in 2023, 2024, with uh, 33% uh, of, of motorcycles corresponding to about 60, uh, past, I mean, 60,700 e motorcycles in 2029, 2029, 20, 20, uh, 30. Those are the indicative uh, values that came up after. Uh, a, a, a study by the consulting team, but we, as on the side of government, uh, it is what the consultants saw, saw from their studies, but we believe with the uh, current political will and the uh, uh, in current initiative that are ongoing, those are pessimistic uh, values, and we believe we're gonna achieve more even by 2024, especially on motorcycles and buses, whereby we think that um, motorcycles, we will achieve 100% uh, in, in a very near future. And buses, though uh, they are expensive, uh, we are trying to give more incentives uh, to have uh, all those uh, vehicle categories, uh, uh, let's say, uh, introduced in our trans transport system, and we believe that by 2030, we will be having a lot of, a, a very significant uh, share of uh, all those categories of vehicles in the transport system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ezran. Very, very well explained. Thank you very much. Let me give to Chris for the question. Can you hear me? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Francois. Yeah. Well, yeah. Based on that um, roadmap that Jean Bier laid out, I wanted to go now to Patrick from Lura and hear about. I mean, we heard from Jean Bier that there is this goal of introducing electric buses, and and so it would be good to hear from Patrick. Um, how how is this integrated with Rura's move to adopt the second generation contracting for the city bus system, and is there a way that e-buses could be part of that process of upgrading to this revamped bus system. And especially considering that we will need to raise the finance to cover the upfront capital cost, as we heard in some of the earlier presentations. So over to Patrick for your insights on the roadmap for e-buses. Uh, thank you, Christopher. Thank you, uh, uh, Francois and others. Uh, maybe before I dive a little bit deep into the, my, my talk, uh, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Patrick Gachilane. I work for Rura and I'm in charge of the immobility uh, and I'm the focal person for the immobility for Rura. Uh, <clears throat> as you know, Rura is a regulatory body that 
authority that uh, regulates ICT, uh, radiation, energy, water and sanitation, transport, consumer affairs, and media. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, so the immobility, it's a nascent, uh, would I say, industry here in Rwanda and in the context of regulation and uh, in, uh, in enabling the immobility in Rwanda, there are too many activities to promote the immobility uh, as far as regulation is concerned. So, so far we, we, we are conducting a market study on immobility. The aim of this study is to discover companies running on the market, discover their business model and service they offer. We don't focus only on the e-buses, we focus on in general on transport services, delivery, charging station, and others. So this will help us to understand these, the challenges that we have identified so that we can start in thinking, thinking of regulations for immobility. So after this study, once again, together with different stakeholders, we shall choose between the soft and hard regulation for, uh, to make sure that the market is more incentivized. So the question here will be uh, either to let the market mature before we put out regulations or issue some regulations to make sure that both consumers and operators are protected in this field of immobility. So as you know, uh, <clears throat> there, there is a recent approved e-government mobility strategy. So the strategy defined, uh, defined to uh, two types of uh, fiscal incentives. Uh, so far, uh, two major incentives had been defined by the, okay, by the strategy as I, I was just saying, and one is already uh, implemented, and it's about uh, taxes. As you know, there is uh, there is for those who had been able to read the uh, to read the, the 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 implemented incentive. It's all about taxes, import the material for immobility, uh, including vehicles, purchase of vehicles. VAT is not there for those uh, you know, tools for immobilities. But uh, for as far as the fiscal incentives is concerned, uh, from our side, uh, we are making sure that <coughs> uh, we avail, avail special tariffs for charging stations and putting them at the same tariffs as industries based on, as I said, the recent approved government strategy on electric, uh, electric mobility. Uh, briefly, this is what we are doing at Rura. Uh, we are, as I said earlier, conducting the market study on immobility to identify challenges. And once again, we are planning to have special uh, tariffs for charging stations to make sure that those who are having those uh, charging stations are benefiting from uh, special tariffs. So thank you. Uh, maybe if we have questions, uh, I can answer them. But briefly, this is what we are doing. And we hope that uh, in the context of regulation, uh, together with stakeholders and partners, uh, we shall achieve uh, uh, great things so that this um, industry can be really enabled. Thank you. Great, thanks Patrick for those insights. And let me hand it back to Francois to continue the discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much, Patrick, for the clarification. It has really us to, uh, to, to take off the immobility. Another question would be for, for Minister again, Janvier. You, you, the minister in charge of the, the whole transport planning for the country in terms of transport, and they have been a transport master from the state of Chigari. I know you are planning to put on the national transport master plan. We have NST1, you have Vision 2050, a number of planning documents. You know, the immobility comes on recently, and there's some planning document that do not cater for the immobility provisions. Any plan or anything planned to revise and incorporate the immobility parts in those planning documents. Yeah, thank you very much. 
Janvier, if you, 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 you heard me, you, you can just say something on, on that. Thank you. Yes, yes, Francois. Uh, yes, moderator, for the good question. Yes, you are right. Uh, the immobility is still a new concept in Rwanda. Uh, and yet uh, some planning document has been confectionated before the, the electric mobility was not actually part of those uh, documents. So aware of that, that's why actually uh, one of the reason we develop a national transport policy and strategy is because the, 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 the national transport policy that we had uh, from 2008 was not consider, considering uh, many other sectors apart from roads and air transport only. So electric mobility as well as other non-conventional modes of transport were the key uh, were the key modes that uh, were to be in, in, incorporated in the, in the overall national transport uh, policy and strategy. And that's why actually uh, we developed this uh, national transport policy and strategy, which we uh, have a, a duration of about 15 years. So uh, in order to, uh, to go in details of the, um, uh, those, uh, I mean, the, to, to incorporate the national, uh, I mean, the electric mobility or electrification of mobility in the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the in the planning documents. That's why I, 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 I said about the national transport master plan we are about to develop, which will give uh, like uh, specifically with details in, uh, 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 we, we put in details some uh, uh, aspect or consideration for immobility. And apart from that, we are also in the process of revising the national, um, some targets on the national um, uh, strategy for transformation, which is the key document uh, governing the development uh, by government within a seven, a seven year term. And the electric mobility is to be, will be considered as well because it is something that we are taking, uh, I mean, we are giving special attention and government and the political will in, in Rwanda is centered uh, on uh, promoting less polluting uh, mobility. Uh, again, to just uh, um, uh, provide some uh, concrete uh, ideas on what we are doing, uh, there is a technical cooperation that is ongoing with um, JICA, whereby we, the, 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 this technical cooperation will start in early next year. We want to, 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 to develop a parking strategy and in that parking strategy, we will uh, electric mobility, electric mobility will be taken into consideration. And as highlighted in, the, in that strategy that was approved the, uh, back in April this year, this was considered as one of measure to give to electric mobility users to be given some uh, uh, preferences some preferences in parking and any uh, and the other uh, and the other uh, infrastructures such as dedicated bus lanes and so on and so forth. So this is just to show that electric mobility is something that we are putting much effort to develop, and we are working together with uh, different stakeholders to ensure that uh, the penetration of EVs is maximum as we anticipate. Thank you very much. If Innocent's not there, then maybe we can go to the last panelist, um, since I, I see we're also close to time. So Alphonse um, from University of Rwanda, maybe you could give us some insights about the role that you see the university playing, um, given that there are a lot of requirements for, for better data to inform um, you know, for instance, the deployment of e-buses, we, you know, we need to know more about the existing system and the kind of drive cycles that are there, and also uh, for deploying charging stations for, for other types of vehicles. So what role do you see the university playing in, in filling that knowledge gap? Over to Alphonse. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, 
and it's very nice to hear from you and uh, and uh, colleagues. Uh, I think from the University of Rwanda side, um, uh, uh, and then we are trying our best also to adapt ourselves to this new technology of immobility. So this is a new uh, area that also the university is trying to see how, especially from the transport uh, planning and engineering perspective, uh, on the immobility side to have uh, to make sure that at least we we adapt our curriculum for the students as well as also uh, for professional training of the uh, professionals from the industry from the transport industry. Uh, so currently, the university we can't say that we we are at advanced stages, but we know that there is a lot to be done because this is a new sector that we need to uh, support in terms of research and in terms of also produce, uh, pro production of uh, uh, skilled uh, people who can be on market. So uh, meeting the demand that the government has in terms of immobility. Uh, so current initiatives that are on progress. So um, uh, we are set, uh, we are now working on a new center for transport and logistics. And this center is also going to be working closely with the Center for Sustainable, Sustainable Energy that is already in place that also more looks at the electric uh, uh, from the electrification perspective. So we're trying to see how we work together to make sure that we, uh, we leverage our efforts on uh, seeing the, from the mobility perspective and also from the electric perspective uh, to see how we can now uh, tap in into the gap that now the government has in terms of research, in terms of data analysis, in terms of also making some informed, uh, informed uh, 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 to really do analysis that can inform the government on better decisions to take in terms of this uh, immobility uh, enrollment. So currently, uh, what is happening is that uh, we trying also, given that this is a new technology, we are trying also to work with the other organizations that are already uh, advanced or are already having some skills. And I think, uh, uh, Chris, if you know, so this uh, also UME, which has also the Urban Living Lab. So we want to see how all most of these courses that are being taught uh, within the social Plus project, but also with other universities and other companies that are already advanced in this field to be able to work together with the university uh, to impart capacity and knowledge so that that can be passed already to our students, uh, the master graduates, uh, the master graduate students. And as, as of now, we are having our students also uh, being taught how this immobility is being done. And I think uh, that's an area that we still need to uh, reinforce and need the support of the technical uh, organization that already advanced on that stage. So in terms of enrollment and the planning of what should be done, I think the university is, is going to uh, play a role in that sense, like also having our master graduate students um, taking their master thesis around immobility uh, topics and be able to develop some models that can be able to inform or support the current ongoing initiatives in immobility. Uh, the other area we think is very key is try to also work with the, uh, with the government and the private industry uh, to look at the gaps they have to make sure that these gaps can be researched and make sure that we produce some uh, data analysis that can help in, in order to inform uh, those decisions. So much as uh, uh, the, the immobility is new in Rwanda, it's also much new in the, in the university. But I think the university is doing uh, adapting itself uh, to make sure that at least we are very close with the industry to run what is going on. So this is what I can uh, say in a nutshell, uh, Chris. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Alphonse. Like that's really exciting to hear about the university taking things head on. Um, and, and also looking at all aspects of it, you know, research, also the student uh, projects and, and then the, the skill training that needs to happen. Um, great. Well, I think with that, um, I want to thank all the panelists for the, their insights. Okay. And yeah, okay. yeah. Hey, someone innocent says he's available. Now, can we give him one minute for the last question? Sure. Yeah, innocent sure. Innocent from yeah. UDCA. Yeah. Thank you very much. Innocent, I think you can hear us well now. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the, the, the question that goes to Red or UDCL is the readiness of the uh, our authority to, to handle the electricity demand. We are cutting off importation of fuel 
and the consumption of electricity will be will go higher. So what is the readiness of the UDCR to provide the, the, the required demand for electricity? Uh, we, we shall be ready even now because, uh, for example, we have a, a, a pit to power plant called the Gishoma. Uh, hello, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes. you. Yes. Uh, with 80 megawatts that uh, very soon coming to the grid, to the national grid. Uh, and uh, there is uh, another hydroelectric power plant called the Rusumo between Rwanda, Tanzania, and Burundi. Um, on our side, we shall import, we, we shall take uh, 25 megawatts also, which is also coming to the grid. So, and uh, we have also uh, another methane, methane gas power plant uh, at uh, Rubavu that is uh, also coming very soon. So we don't have any problem of supplying that demand. Thank you. Thank you very much for the quick and the uh, uh, promising question that we, we have a required demand. Uh, at least we have many questions, but I have a proposal. Can we ask Emily to record these questions and it can be answered and sent to the respective people who ask the question because we are running out of time. What do you think? Yeah, that sounds great, um, Francois. Yeah, I think Emily shared the email addresses for the UA19. So if, if anyone has other questions, feel free to send them in and, and we can get back to you. Thanks. So back yeah, to Thank Emily. you very much. Yeah. Emily, now you. The mic is yours. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you for the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Francois and Chris, uh, for the great moderation and uh, the panelists, Janvier, Alphonse, everyone. Uh, it was a great uh, exchange, and I think that overall it was a great session with a lot of uh, very interesting uh input so really thanks for being here and presenting i will now uh give uh, some closing words thank you thanks a lot so very briefly uh so thanks again uh, um, as we said at the beginning we will have further sessions this week uh for dar salam two days uh, for Dar Salaam, and then on Friday, we have a session for the Kenyan cities. Uh, but it's not only all, and also for Kigali, we will have uh, very soon a global training on e-buses, so we, we can go even deeper on the topic of public transport electrification. And we will also have a specific peer-to-peer -peer exchange on setting up um, electric bike share uh, systems with input from uh, India, from Cairo, for, from European cities. So please uh, stay tuned. And I would like to give the last word to communicate on a very uh, soon event on the 3rd of November, uh, 3.30 to 5 Kigali time in the afternoon. We will uh, present the results of a really also great project that we have done uh, through Urban Pathways, which is UN Habitat, UNEP, the Wuppertal Institute, UMI. Um, and we had the great support uh, from the University of Rwanda, from Alphonse, from Egid Kalisa, and Ampersand, where we were, we were able to deploy mobile sensors monitoring air uh, quality in Kigali. So you can see here the map. So we will show the results, uh, recommendations, and we would be very happy to, to have you there as well, because I think that we also achieved quite some interesting results. So um, we will send you the invitation um, and we look forward to, to having you there. Thanks again for everyone. Um, and we wish you a very good day. Thanks. Thank you very much, Emily. Thank you. Thank you and bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Bye, bye, bye. bye.